Hi, oh, it's been a while since the Rock 64 was released into the wild for hackers. But, eight months on, how good is this board looking? Let's find out. I just don't know what he's capable of. I gained your trust. You lost mine. Well, sort something out. Do it properly this time. This time, there will be no winners. Hey, he's back. There will be no struggle. What? He, he injected a Trojan through the power grid. That's going to coalesce the SQL buffers. We'd better modify the CPU scrubbers. Uh, let me think. Uh, BIOS buffering. Primary clock buffers on the TPS interface will just implode. We'll have to take the risk of SSL exposure or just run the risk of damping the frequency compensators. Both risks are far too great. You'll scramble the Higgs shift compressor and expose the firewall. They will be just the hacker. A lot of you will know about the original Pine 64. It was a Kickstarter that launched back in December 2015. It looked like the best, cheapest SPC around, but unfortunately, they ended up promising more than they could deliver. The Pine 64 guys have been steadily repairing their damaged reputation since, and by the looks of their recent SPC, I reckon they've done a great job. The Rock 64 was released to minimal fanfare. There weren't any outrageous claims like supercomputer, and they have adopted more of a wig approach. However, they've made it as easy as possible to get on board with this new SBC by providing a customised flashing tool based on Etcher, where you can download and burn a number of OS images. For this video, I ran several distros, the stock Debian Jesse, Diet Pi, Docker container based on Xenial, and of course Ambient, which is one of the best OSs you can use. So what do you get for your hard-earned 25 US dollars? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. USB 3.0 host port, two USB 2.0 ports, gigabit ethernet, audio visual jack, HDMI out capable of 4K at 60 hertz, five volt three amp DC power jack, IR receiver, eMMC socket, reset button, flash recovery button, power button, standard Pi 2 GPIO header, and an additional header breaking out 12 more GPIOs and 100 megabit ethernet. The first eight pins are compatible with the Raspberry Pi P5 header. We also have the RK805, which is a rock chip design PMIC that not only has four DC buck converters, soft start and power sequencing, but an onboard RTC accessible over ITC, an RTL8211F gigabit ethernet transceiver, the SGM89000 stereo line driver, which has a decent signal to noise ratio of around 114 decibels, 128 megabit SPI flash, and on this board at least one gigabit DDR3 RAM. You can also have two gig or four gig DDR3 RAM. And lastly, the RK3328, which is a 64 bit quad core SOC with frequency scaling up to 1.3 gigahertz. On the flip side, it's really quite boring, with only an SD slot. Okay, moving on. So from the GPIO perspective, what works and what doesn't? I had no issues with either of the I2C buses. My handy dandy temperature sensor responded okay on every OS. GPIOs were also accessible without issue. However, SPI was another thing altogether. In every distro, SPI wasn't available at all. It was certainly present in the device tree, but there was no working kernel module. Looking at the RK3328 datasheet, there should be three SPI buses. However, on the schematic, SPI2 goes directly to SPI flash and also the Pi GPIO header. This is guaranteed to cause issues with some SPI devices when using the SPI flash for booting. You can read the SPI flash easily via the MTD subsystem interface on Linux. I added in the Docker image test this time around, as Docker is the future for SBC makers. 
Once installed, you have a blank slate, which is easily filled with, for example, an own cloud image. Just pull it from the Docker Hub. Once the image is downloaded and installed, you can spin it up. This command will allow it to listen on port 80. Then point your browser at the IP address of the ROC64. And you have your own cloud instance up and running. I downloaded and fired up the own cloud app for my Mac and was able to sync a video straight to the ROC64. Pretty easy stuff. On the network performance side, I noticed a slight increase in TCP throughput compared to last time. Using stock Debian, I saw 618 megabits per second, while on Xenial Docker image, it bumped up to 881 megabits per second. I did see the same ugly network dropout issue appearing on all the distros, except of course for Xenial, requiring me to force the NIC 200 megabit full duplex. However, Xenial does have a more recent kernel version. I haven't checked to see what has changed, but it looks like that issue has been finally fixed. So moving on to Pharonix tests. I cracked out my Uber heatsink again to ensure the CPU frequency didn't scale down and hammered it on two of the Linux distros, DiPi and Xenial. There was only around a two to three degree drop in temperature when adding the heatsink whilst idle. I saw an average of 36 degrees Celsius with an ambient room temperature of 28 degrees Celsius. So it runs pretty cool. I ran a number of Phronix tests. One test that I would have liked to include was a cryptocurrency benchmark, but as of publication, none supported the ROC64 from the current Phronix release. I concentrated the benchmarks on CPU and IO performance. I didn't do any 4K graphics tests because alas, I don't have a 4K display. If you want to see some graphics benchmarks, then check out the CNX software review. Links are below and on my website. On RAM speed tests, the ROC64 jostled for position with friendly elect boards, high key and tinkerboard, but was regularly half the speed of the UDU x86. On small PT, it sat around the middle of the pack with other boards priced at two times. In terms of performance, there wasn't much in it at all. Fast Fourier transform tests had the ROC64 showing up the almost untouchable UDU x86 and was twice as fast as the Pi 3 while the gzip and pbzip2 file compression results were surprisingly laggy. Almost all the results were similar, with the ROC64 sitting in amongst all the other boards I've tested so far. This is actually pretty good, considering what you're getting for the price. During the Pharonix test, I saw the temperature stay around the 38 degrees Celsius mark, with a peak of 56.8 degrees Celsius during the timed hammer tests. Whilst the average power consumption was around 800 milliamps with a peak of 1.1 amps. Incidentally, while powered off, it draws a little under 100 milliamps, which is fairly low for an SBC. You can check out all these results on my website. So what do I think of the ROC64? I think this time round it's a much better offering from Pine64. It's clear that they have learnt their lesson and are concentrating on building quality products cheaply which was their MO from the beginning, even though their marketing was a little dubious. From what I can see, most of the community are concentrating on NAS and storage, and not so much on the traditional maker side of this board. No surprise there, because for 25 US dollars, you get a board that can push out 4K at 60 Hertz, along with gigabit ethernet and USB 3.0. Don't forget, you also have an additional 100 megabit ethernet. I suspect that the SPI flash chip will cause some devices to not play nice on the SPI bus, leaving it largely useless for things like OLED displays, but the jury is still out on that one. In terms of heat dissipation, you could actually get by without a heatsink for most applications, as the SOC runs fairly cool, but I suspect that when viewing 4K video, things might get a little hot. So we are finally seeing what the Pine64 product would have been like, and it's a good lesson for any SBC maker out there. Don't promise the world, make onboarding easy, and respect the community that you are developing. Anyway, thanks for watching, and see you next week.